we gather together today as the dear family and friends of Harriet, Harriet Margolis. As we mourn her loss, we must also celebrate the full, rich life she led. Death has taken our beloved Harriet. Friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O God, and be with them. For her love that united us in life and which death cannot sever. For her companionship, which we shared along life's path and which still continues through the tenderness of memory. For the gifts of her heart and her mind, which brought us joy and happiness and now become a precious heritage of the spirit. For all these and more, God, we give you our praise. In his sorrow, Job cried out, Adonai Natan Banai Lakach, Yehi Shem Adonai Mevarach. God has given, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. In ancient people, we are well acquainted with grief and with the valley of shadows. Death and sorrow are not strangers to us. Yet the centuries have taught us a good name endures beyond the grave. And there is strength in faith. With Job we say, Adonai Natan, God you have given. You gave us a loved one who will not be forgotten. For all was good and enduring in her life. We offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. A poem entitled, My Hereafter. Do not come when I am dead to sit beside a low green mound or bring the first daffodils because I love them so. For I shall not be there. You cannot find me there. I will look up at you from the eyes of little children. I will bend to meet you in the swaying boughs of bud-thrilled trees and caress you with the passionate sweep of storm-filled winds. I will give you strength in your upward tread of everlasting hills. I will cool your tired body in the flow of the river. I will warm your work-glorified hands through the glow of the winter fire. I will soothe you into forgetfulness to the drop, drop of the rain on the roof. I will speak to you out of the rhymes of the masters. I will dance with you in the lilt of the violin, make your heart leap with the bursting cadence of the organ. I will flood your soul with the flaming radiance of the sunrise and bring you peace in the tender rose and gold of the after sunset. All these have made me happy. They are part of me and I shall become a part of them. Proverbs 31. A woman of valor who can find. She is more precious than fine pearls. Her husband trusts in her and so he lacks nothing. She does him good, never harm all the days of her life. She perceives that her labor is rewarding. Her candle burns on into the night. She reaches out to those in need and extends her hands to the poor. She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she faces the future cheerfully. She speaks with wisdom. The law of kindness is on her lips. Her children rise up and bless her. Her family sings her praises. Many daughters have done valiantly, but you, you excel them all. Take time to talk, for you may ask of all things unknown to you. Take time to laugh, for smiles relinquish sorrow and spread happiness. Take time to think, for the realm of knowledge is never ending. Take time to see, for there is beauty in every part of the world around you. Take time to feel. For the emotions of your heart often control the reasoning of your mind. Take time to live, for each day is filled with new opportunities that will be gone tomorrow. Take time to dream, for survival is forever challenging the powers of your imagination. Take time to love, for the sharing of all these things 
is a true miracle of life. Adonai roi lo exar, bina desha yar bitzeni, amei minachot yanachaleni. Please join me now in the familiar words of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters and restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. <coughs> the Baal Shem Tov, the Hasidic Rebbe, once observed that there are three ways to mourn. The first is with tears, the second is with silence, and the third is with song. When we mourn someone truly beloved, we experience all three. Tears at first, then silence as our grief settles more deeply, and finally song as we're able to celebrate the memories we hold deep in our hearts. So today be a time for tears. As we say our final goodbyes to Harriet, we each remember Harriet in our own way, Mitchell and Marilyn, Mimi and Ted, Susan and Joe, you remember Harriet as your beloved mother. Harriet was a loving grandmother to Nikki and Brian, Paul and Ashley, Jennifer and Mike, Joey and Jenny and Lisa, and an adoring great grandmother to Jesse, Matthew, Andrea, Addie, Jonathan, and Madison. Throughout her life, Harriet was a caring sister and sister in law to Bertha and Al. Rose and Ben, Louie and Carol, and Carl and Mary, Jack and Lil, Sam and Ada, Helen and Mark, Eddie and Pearl and Harlane, and a dear aunt and great aunt to many nieces and nephews. Harry was very close with her cousins, Esther and Abe. Esther was like a sister to her. They were born on the same day, one year apart. Harriet's three older siblings were born in Russia. Her father Isaac came to the United States, and then her mother Clara traveled to New York alone with three babies on the Lus Lusitania. That boat sunk on the way back to Europe. Harriet was born in New York, she was the American child, on April 18, 1924. Harriet's sisters really raised her and Americanized her. She told her kids they bought her her first bra. Harriet's sister Rose grew up and moved to Seattle to work, and soon the whole family followed. Harriet graduated from high school in Seattle and then worked as a civil servant in the Army. They held programs for the Jewish soldiers, and that is where she met her beloved Leo. They claimed it was love at first sight. After the war, he was discharged and came home here to Cleveland. But much of his family had relocated to California, so he went to visit them and traveled to Seattle to visit Harriet. Harriet told Leo, you're not leaving here without me. And they had a two-day engagement, got special permission from a rabbi to get married between Passover and Shavuot, which isn't usually permitted, and were married two days later in a beautiful wedding. Together they moved to Los Angeles, where Mitchell was born, then they returned to Seattle, where Mimi was born, and finally moved back to L.A., where Susan was born. Then Leo decided it was time to leave the family and move out on their own. Leo was offered jobs in Chicago and Cleveland, and since he knew Cleveland, he decided to come here. Leo came first and bought a house all by himself on Charney Road in University Heights, and then Harriet Similar to what her mother had done, schlepped three little kids across the country, this time by plane, to move to Cleveland. Harriet stayed at home with the kids, but helped Leo in his business with his books and his receivables. As the kids got older, she would spend more time at his office, often bringing his lunch on a tray. Harriet loved to entertain. 
She excelled in her display of food. Leo, who was in the food industry, would help by slicing the turkey or brisket beautifully. Leo often traveled all week and would return home on Fridays. So Harriet would make a beautiful Shabbat dinner every week. She always made it feel very special. Harriet's children will finally remember her carrot ring, matzo ball soup, and of course Thanksgiving dinner. Harriet always had a dinner plan. Monday was steaks, Tuesday spaghetti, Wednesday they ate leftovers, Thursday were, was fish or liver and onions, and Friday was chicken or brisket. On Sundays, every box of cereal came out and Harriet made salami and eggs. But when Harriet prepared these things, she did it flawlessly and easily. Everything came out of the fridge. The meal would start with a cup of soup and include many courses. It was a beautiful display. Harriet loved to host major parties in their backyard on Kerwick. She would rent a tent and Lee would say, we're entertaining again? Harriet's children have fond memories of spending every summer at Lake Liberty in Spokane, Washington at their Aunt Bertha's house with all of their cousins. Harriet was always very active. She had a wide range of friends. She was involved in the High Fi Club, a finance club that made investments. She was the treasurer. Harriet played tennis and exercised, and she also worked at the Mayfield JCC. They called her the lady at the window. She was the receptionist. Harriet also ushered up Playhouse Square and was involved in Jewish war veterans. She enjoyed working at the polls during elections. Harriet just never stopped. She loved being involved with Park Synagogue Sisterhood. First, she held the job of lunch lady and arranged all the weekly Tuesday lunches. Harriet always had cottage cheese in the back in case someone didn't like lunch. She took great pride in this work. And then she served as president of Park Synagogue Sisterhood. Harriet brought her children to Hebrew school at Park three days a week and insisted the girls finish Hebrew high school. Harriet herself took Hebrew lessons at the synagogue. Because Harriet didn't have family in town, her friends became like family. She was devoted to them. Harriet adopted people. The first people she connected it with were a couple from Israel with a little boy, the Austrian family, Donnie and Ziona. They spent all the holidays at, with the Margulis family and became part of the family. Harriet also took in Fulbright scholars from Czechoslovakia who became as professors to John Carroll. First the one would come, then the whole family would come, and they lived with Harriet for two to three years at a time. Harriet absolutely loved doing this. Harry and Leo also enjoyed traveling. Often Leo won trips through work. Harry loved Palm Springs, and together they went to Israel, Greece, Rome, and Venezuela. Harry took a cruise with her cousin Yvonne to the Panama Canal. And Harry did all this impeccably dressed. She was beautiful, and her trick was to never stop moving. Harry loved her grandchildren like crazy whether they were near or far. Harriet always sent a card and remembered special occasions. She would send a $10 check or a stick of gum. In Cleveland, Harriet loved going to all of Jennifer's plays and show choir concerts or to Joey's wrestling matches. When Lisa was adopted, Harriet went for a week to help care for her. It was her second nature to care for others. Even during the last years in the nursing home, she tried to help people and feed them. She got in trouble sometimes, but she tried to feed people. She always asked Bobby, the activity lady, what can I help with? Harriet wanted to clean her office. <laughs> Harriet Margolis was a beautiful person inside and out. So today may be a time for tears. We are saddened by the loss of Harriet, but we learn much from her, especially how to care for one another. Let these tears serve to strengthen and uphold you as a family. There's a story in our tradition about a rabbi who once passed an old woman planting trees. Old woman, he called, why are you planting those trees? You'll never live to see them blossom. But the woman replied, my ancestors planted trees, not for themselves, but for us 
that we might enjoy their shade and their fruit. I too do the same for all those who come after me. Harriet planted an orchard for each one of us, an orchard filled with devotion and love, and these will always be here for us. We must be grateful that we're able to share in Harriet's life. Tomorrow there'll be fewer tears, more silence. As the Baal Shem Tov noted, it will be a time for pondering, a time for contemplation. Harriet will become a greater part of our characters and our beings as we integrate the memories and the values she taught us into our own selves. But finally, there'll come a time for song. The time will come when we can celebrate Harriet, when we recall all that we learned from her and how she touched each of our lives. May she rest in peace. Zecher Siracha Livracha. May the memory of Harriet Margolis be a blessing. Amen. Let us pause for a moment of silence as we remember Harriet in our own hearts. And now I'd like to invite Mitchell, and then following Mitchell, Jennifer will speak to share some personal words about their mother and grandmother. Mitchell, come forward. Thank you all for coming today. I wanted to share a few recollections and images I have about mom. First off, acts of service was one of her ways of showing love. Her home was always open to others. <clears throat> Over the years, she took in several visiting professors from Europe who were coming to teach at John Carroll to live with her, and they became fast friends, and they stayed in touch even after the professors returned to Europe. As was said, Mom joined a Havara and adopted a family from Israel who had immigrated to Cleveland, and they developed a relationship that has lasted for years even to today. Um, during my elementary school years, Mom was the president of the PTA. During her tenure, I got into some mischief at school, so I know I didn't make it any easier for her, but all was forgiven. Mom was also very involved in the Park Synagogue Sisterhood, first uh, in the baking uh, department and then becoming president of the sisterhood. <laughs> that time I behaved myself and didn't cause any problems. She always told me to zia mensch. <laughs> During my Little League baseball career, Mom was the team secretary recording victories and losses for the league newspaper. When I came up to bat, I could always hear her cheering for me, and I still do. Mom was a blood donor, and at one point, Red Cross told her she had donated the maximum allowable, and she couldn't do it anymore. Mom did Dad's books at his office, and she would always be bringing him his lunch when she went down there. Mom always prepared a Shabbat meal on Friday night. We did the candles, wine, and bread, and Mom was the glue that brought us together. Given that Mom was about helping others, it's no surprise that her three children are all in the helping professions. Susan's a respiratory therapist, Mimi a physical therapist, and I'm a psychotherapist. That was all Mom's doing. Mom was famous for her entertaining. A picture in my mind that was experienced over and over is anywhere from 8 to 16 people seated around the dining room table. And here's Mom carrying one dish after another out from the kitchen to place on the table. It was a culinary parade extraordinaire. If any of you were at that table, you know you didn't leave Harriet's house hungry. <coughs> mom, we thank you for that and so much more. We're also very grateful for the care Mom received first at the Meyer Assisted Living Program and then at Heritage Manor Nursing Home where she was for 13 years. Thank you. Hello, little nice thing. Those were the last words that she had said to me. My grandmother, one of the most vivacious, graceful, and loving women I have ever known, was trapped inside herself, bound by a disease she had no choice in contracting, 
sitting in a room that had items from her home and a place where she slept, but a place that she hardly lived. Seeing her decline over the past 15 years has been horrible. But when I think of my grandma, I don't think of the woman at Heritage Manor. I think of the woman on Kerwick Drive, ready to hug you as soon as the door flew open. One of my earliest memories as a child was of her and my grandpa Leo welcoming me into their home. And I must have been very young because their excitement and glasses scared me. While growing up in Cleveland, Grandma would pick me up for lunch when I didn't have school. But before lunch, we would have a minimum of three errands to run. We had to drop off lunch for an elderly family from her sisterhood, donate blood at the Red Cross Blood Drive, drop off her recycling at the fire station. And she loved having my brother and I join her. We sat in her big car with the leather seats, often having to put towels down because the seats were too hot. I would often call her the hostess with the mostess, a one-woman welcoming committee, and there was always room for her, at her table for strangers and, fa and their family. And she had friends everywhere, and not just friends, but friends, people you could rely on. And I know she loved to show me off. I have very specific memories of singing and dancing and putting on shows for her friends, and she encouraged me to fly. When I saw her in 2015, I was able to spend about three hours with her one-on-one. -on -one. I held her hand, and we listened to music like Frank, Frank Sinatra, and I talked to her, and then I sang, and I tried to sing every standard that I could remember. And as I held her hand and sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow, she looked at me and started singing along. I smile now at that memory. It would be the last time. Oh, and then she also said, hello, little nice thing. And I smile and I think of that memory. It would be the last thing that she truly said to me. I know my grandfather, her sisters, her cousins, and her friends are welcoming her into heaven. And of course, my grandfather will be saying, Harriet, what took you so long? <laughs> I miss her. I've missed her for a long time. I've been mourning her for over a decade. And in that time, I've been thinking of all the beautiful life lessons that she's taught me. And here are a few. Number one, always call to check in. Two, carry a minimum of three bags with you at all times, because you never know what you're going to need something. Number three, welcome the stranger. Open your doors to others. They might be in need of a hot meal or a bed to sleep in. Four, Find the good in everyone, even the crabby people. Number five, never be afraid to stop, start clapping when you're in the audience. And she would always do that when I would be at my plays at Heights Youth Theater. I knew when she was there because she was the first one to clap <laughs> in, during a song. <laughs> Number six, never stop moving. It reminds you that you're living, even if you have to walk the perimeter of the basketball courts on your lunch break at the JCC. Number seven, always appreciate the color of the trees. You'll never know if you'll ever see a tree so green before. Number eight, drink coffee, whether it's fresh or not, and drink wine, especially when ironing. <laughs> Number nine, burnt toast can be good, especially with orange marmalade with a slice of cheese. Number 10, save every leftover. Eventually, it will become my lunch. <laughs> Number 11, check the expiration dates every once in a while. <laughs> Number 12, it's OK to sneak a cigarette now and then. <laughs> Number 13, always keep the radio on when you leave the house. 14, always have some towels available to sit on those hot leather seats, especially after swimming. Number 15, always keep Kleenex in your purse and some hard candy. Number 16, always have trays to put your papers on to slide under your bed for when you have company. <laughs> and then a few others are, sometimes a coat of red lipstick ties everything together. Give blood, volunteer, be a gracious host, give to others, be proud of your family, love fiercely, and love deeply. I will forever be Harriet's granddaughter. 
and I will use her life as a beacon of what I should or shouldn't do. Just remember, WWHD, what would Harriet do? <laughs> I will live by her creed, our family motto, and her most important lesson of all, Zaya Mensch. Thank you. Thank you both for your beautiful, touching words. Birth is a beginning, and death a destination. But life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity, and youth to age, from innocence to awareness, and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness and back, we pray to health again. From offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, and grief to understanding, from fear to faith. From defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see victory lies not at some high place along the way, but having made the journey stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage to life everlasting. Amen. If you are able, please rise now for El Malay Rachamim, God full of compassion. El Malay Rachamim, Shochen Bamromim, Hamse Minocha Nichona Tachat Kanfe Hashlina, Im Kidoshima Tiharim, Kazora Harakia Mazirim, Et Nishmat, Heshi Bat Chaya Vayitchak, Shalacha Laolam Ma, Bal Harachamim, Yasi Rechu Besetter Kinafav Laolamim, Vayitzra Bitzra Hachaim Et Nishmata, Renaihu Nachalata, Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to our beloved Harriet Margolis, known in our tradition as Heshi Bat Yitzchak Vechaya, who has entered eternity. eternity. O God of mercy, let her find refuge in your eternal presence, and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she rest in peace and let us all say amen. 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 may be seated for a few moments. This concludes our service here. We'll proceed from here to Beit Olam Cemetery for burial. And following burial, the family will be observing Shiva at Mimi and Ted's home, 14765 Aspen Hills Lane in Burton. Today until 8 p.m., Tomorrow, Friday, 2 to 4 p.m., Saturday evening, 7 to 9 p.m., and Sunday through Thursday, 2 to 4 and 7 to 9 p.m.